Monitor. 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 2000 hours Greenwich Mean Time. This is Monitor, reporting the nation and the world. The combined radio and television networks of the National Broadcasting Company bring you the premier broadcast of Monitor. The new NBC radio service originating from NBC's Electronic Communication Center, Radio Central New York. Now, to introduce Monitor to America, here is the president of the National Broadcasting Company, Mr. Sylvester L. Weaver. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Monitor, our new NBC weekend radio service. This is a preview, which will be seen on television for the next hour, and it will be heard on radio until midnight tonight, New York time. But beginning next week, Monitor will start each Saturday morning at 8 o'clock New York time and run until midnight on Sunday. It will bring you a continuous flow of items of high interest and information. Monitor is for all of you, wherever you are, in your cars, at home, at the beach with your portables, everywhere. And on Monitor, we are going to throw away the radio clock. We are going to bring you what we hope is the radio pattern of the future. News and information and entertainment in the vignette form, where the items are as long as they need to be or as short. Well, over a weekend, there'll be a half a hundred people serving you from Radio Central here. And among them and here today for you to meet are Dave Garraway and Bob and Ray, Morgan Beatty, Walter Kiernan, Clifton Fadiman, Ben Grauer, and many, many others. Now, including in this group, we have our executive producer of Monitor, a man who has been a part of a number of uh, great pioneering ventures in NBC, Jim Fleming. Jim, I've talked about something about the show that we're going to have today. Perhaps you'd better tell us about the people and the places that we're going to be hearing in the next hour. Well, thank you, Pat. In a moment, we're going to turn our live cameras and microphones to the West Coast, to Hermosa Beach, California, where a Sunday afternoon jazz concert's underway. Then up the coast we go, and uh, we're going to a place where there is no freedom. That would be San Quentin Prison. San Quentin? Mm -hmm. San Quentin. We going inside? Uh, inside, well, yes, monitor goes places. So long as we don't have to stay. Well, now, what about sports today? Well, the most unusual sports commentator in the business is standing by at his favorite tavern. Uh, huh? And uh, news and opinion. Well, we'll have the late headlines, comments by columnist Roscoe Drummond from Washington, Istanbul is coming up on the circuit. Aha. Uh -huh. And travel? A plane is standing by at this moment to go nonstop to London from Idlewild Airport. A monitor transport uh, transmitter is aboard. Good enough. What about entertainment? Well, uh, Art Van Dam Quintet live from Chicago. Uh, Jerry Lewis filmed in the Catskills. Uh, live summer theater pickup, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. What about philosopher and thinkers? Well, uh, we have yourself, sir. Well, now, let's uh, <laughs> steady. Let's talk about what we've really got. Well, not to mention uh, President Pusey of Harvard and uh, Bill Saltonstall of Phillips Exeter. Oh, yes. Well, I think you've already gotten into vignettes and what's ahead. Let's talk about what's first. Well, the top news headlines of this hour, and here is Dave Garraway. And here are those headlines. From Bonn, West German Chancellor Adenauer is flying to Washington for talks with President Eisenhower. He is due there tomorrow. From Detroit, midnight strike deadline approaching as GM and officials of the United Auto Workers Union seek to settle their dispute. From Sumter, South Carolina, the Ku Klux Klan is out of hiding, holds its first open meeting in three years. And from Le Mans in France, the greatest auto tragedy in history, 85 dead in the crash of the sports car race at Le Mans, about 100 miles southwest of Paris. And Dave, uh, when this uh, crash occurred, uh, Monitor was there with BBC's uh, reporter, uh, Mr. Baxter, Raymond Baxter, and this is his broadcast a moment after that crash happened that killed so many at Le Mans. Here it is. Disaster struck hard here at a point some 150 yards to the right of our stand, roughly halfway along the pit. And this is what happened, I think, because although I saw it while I was waiting for broadcast to London, I found it hard to remember exactly what happened. The needle spun like a top, but not Macklin, I am happy to say, escaped with a very severe shaking. The Mercedes, however, struck the wall on the outside of the road, and as it burst into flames, the engine plowed through the crowd, which at that point was 12 or 14 feet, and so killing 30 people and injuring 50. 
The disaster has cast a cloud over the race of 1955, which many, many hours of exciting racing will, I do not think, dispel. This is Raymond Baxter in Le Mans. Uh, that was Raymond Baxter of the BBC at Le Mans. A moment after the tragedy occurred this weekend, that was almost, I suppose, 20 hours ago. Uh, it's now just past 4 o'clock in New York City. Hello, Paris. Hello, Frank. Bert Holzer. Hello, Jim Fleming. Uh, what's the latest toll in this tragedy at Le Mans? The latest toll, not completely accurate, but the best we can get from the reports gathered from various hospitals around Le Mans shows 84 persons dead around 100 wounded, and of those 100, at least five so seriously wounded they may not survive. And yet the race continued to the very end, is that true? The race continued to the end without further serious mishap. There were a few other uh, smaller accidents, and the Mercedes stable of cars, the Mercedes company withdrew their cars because it was one of theirs that uh, caused the serious accident. Well, thank you, Frank Bergholzer. We'll be checking in again on Monitor. And that's it, Pat. Wherever the story is, Monitor's going to try to go there. That's a somber one indeed, but the most important story this weekend. There are livelier stories ahead. Uh, Bonn, Germany, Buenos Aires, uh, West Coast. We're on at the scene in Detroit where the negotiations are going underway. Monitor microphones are outside the conference room. That's how it's going. Well, Monitor certainly seems to be moving. You know, we call this area here the communication center. We built it especially for our new service, Radio Central is our, our name for it. And it's located on the fifth floor of the RCA building, 30 Rockwell Plaza in New York. And all the visitors who come to NBC can get a good look at Radio Central. Matter of fact, I'm, I think somebody... All right, if you folks will just step this Ray. way, we have something we think you'll be very interested in seeing. It's called Radio Central. What was it? Radio Central, sir. What do you mean? It's like New York Central? Uh, no, I think you're thinking of a radio. Oh, I see. This is the communications headquarters here. Did you say this is, uh, well, these are all communicators in there now? Oh, that's right. A monitor is a communicator. I see. And this is what, a radio program? A radio program. That's right. All of this. Well, why are you uh, televising a radio program? Well, nobody's ever asked me that question. Sir, I'll try to find the answer for you right after. But this sir. is... Radio Central. Radio Central, right. Would you like to catch you? I would. Oh, no, I, I'm not allowed to while uh, we're on duty. Thanks, Mr. Sainz. And now, we're going places again. Now that you know what Bob and Ray do on their weekends, Monetary travels now across 3,000 miles of the continent for two contrasts in American life this Sunday afternoon. First to Hermosa Beach, California, and then to San Quentin. Life at Hermosa Beach at this hour is a pretty gay affair, I can tell you. And so for the first of many monitor musical remotes, here is the Pacific Ocean with Howard Rumsey and his Lighthouse All-Stars. Hermosa Beach, California, welcomes Monitor. I'm Howard Runzi, play bass with the All-Stars you've been hearing, and we have a jazz concert like this every Sunday afternoon. In fact, every Sunday afternoon for the past seven years. We're 100 yards from the Pacific here in this busy little beach town just outside the Los Angeles city limits, 10 minutes from the big L.A. International Airport. Maybe you know some of the men in the band. Frank Rossellino, trombone. Bob Cooper, oboe and tenor. <laughs> Bud Shank, flute and alpha sax. 
Stan Levy drums. And Claude Williamson at the piano. We all record for various labels individually, and then together we record on the Lighthouse series for Contemporary. You can see the cover of our latest LP. Bud and Cooper changing from the woodwinds to the saxophones. The number you heard first was Happy Town. The next, Jazz Invention. Rodney Evans Bacon, the seal and the pelican, courtesy of the Hermosa Beach Ocean Aquarium. Monitor moves on now from Hermosa Beach and the music of the Lighthouse All-Stars to a contrasting Sunday afternoon scene here on the coast. From the largest of California state prisons, here is the Monitor's San Quentin report. And here is Walter McGraw. I'm standing on a guard walk at San Quentin. Behind me is the gas chamber. To my right... The north block will be going in there in a moment. Below me, in the big yard, are some 4,000 men. They represent around 13,000 years served and to be served. We'll talk to some of those men later. We'll also talk to the men who are responsible for handling these men. The first of these, Richard McGee. What exactly is your position, sir? I'm director of the State Department of Corrections. Which means means that I am uh, head of the State Department, which is responsible for the management of our eight state prisons. Isn't there quite a bit of difference in many ways between the California prison system and uh, those of other states? Yes, I think it would be fair to say that. How? Well, for one thing, we have an indeterminate sentence law in California. The courts send people to the jurisdiction of the director of corrections instead of to a particular institution. Well, that puts quite a bit more responsibility on the prison, doesn't it? Yes, it does, because uh, uh, we feel that we have a responsibility to rehabilitate these men while we have them uh, with us. You use the word rehabilitation. What's the difference between rehabilitation and uh, punishment? Well, in my view, uh, punishment is a negative approach to the problem. Rehabilitation is a positive approach. 
we feel that we have a responsibility for carrying on programs in these institutions which will uh, attempt to readjust these men and return them to society better than when we got them. All right, to find out a little more about that, we're going into the North Block here. There, Peg McGraw will be talking to Warden Harley Teets. Tell me, Warden Teets, how many men are there currently locking in North Block? There's 757 men quartered in this cell block. 757. How many men should there be? We have 414 one-man cells in this building. Isn't that about twice as many men as you should have? That's right. Pretty tricky, isn't it? It is, and we believe it contributes to about 75% of our disciplinary problems. Eat God, 75%. I would like very much for the audience to see one of these cells because isn't it sort of against the uh, law for that many men to uh, be doubled up like this? It is not against the law, but it is against our standards, which provide for 400 cubic feet of space per man. We have here 376 for two men. If you can look in there, you'll see the two bunks right together. How do the men get out of bed? Can they get out of bed at the same time? One man must remain on the bunk while the other man's engaged. But this overcrowding and double locking contributed to riots throughout the country. Uh, how come nothing happened here? In spite of the negative things of overcrowding and some idleness, we have many activities around here. For example, 2,000 men enrolled in the various educational activities. We believe if you keep a man busy, you're not too much trouble with him. Well, they've sure been busy. The week that we've spent here, there have been men all over the place. Industries, education. We'll hear more about the men in a few seconds when we return to Walter McGraw, who is now on the wall. From time to time today, Monitor will be returning to San Quentin. When it does, we'll be talking to many of the men you see down below us there. We'll also go way over beyond that shed there into the mess hall. We'll be talking to the men then as they eat. Also, a radio first. We're going to eavesdrop on an inmate council meeting. The inmate council is a daring experiment in the prison world. We're going to have microphones in there, but the men won't know when they're going to be hot. There will be no officials in there. I won't even be in there. We will just listen to what happens naturally and ordinarily every week in the inmate council meeting. As I say, this is a radio first. We'll also be talking to men who have just come into San Quentin. We'll be talking to men who are about to go out. In just about one hour, we'll be talking to a man who has been condemned to the gas chamber in California. Until then, Monitor continues from Radio Control in New York. And we're back in New York City now. We'll be going back to San Quentin, as Walter McGraw told you, every hour between now and midnight Eastern Daylight Time.